welcome to chapter one. This week's chapter one is Sleight of Hand. It is the first book in a new series called The Maisie Doss Mysteries. Chapter one. I slid my pink rimmed sunglasses up to rest on my head, pushing a loose auburn curl back into place. My southern drawl was as thick as molasses, but it carried a bite that could rival the local moonshine. Honey, I'm like sweet tea, I'd say and wink. Southern brood, not for the faint of heart. Those who knew me knew that was the gospel truth. And I found myself in a dimly lit confines of a dusty secondhand store staring at a rickety curio cabinet filled to the brim with precious moment figurines. The air was a mix of mothballs and long forgotten memories, but my mind was on business, not nostalgia. There he stood, Mr. Shifty, as I silently dubbed him. At the store's counter, his eyes flitted around nervously beneath his cowboy hat as he attempted to make a purchase. Every twitch, Every shifty scan of the room was like a neon sign flashing guilty in my mind. Trying to keep my cool, I skimmed the precious moment collection. Then to my surprise, one particular figurine seemed to call out to me. Lord have mercy. Mama has been harping about this one, I said. I couldn't help myself. I pulled out my bedazzled smartphone and snapped a quick pic, sending it off to Mama with a cheeky ring any bells. But as luck would have it, the guy at the counter must have felt my gaze. He whipped around and in sheer panic ducked out of sight. My sequins pursed. It strapped. It snagged the edge of the cabinet. Everything seemed to move in a slow motion as the cabinet teetered and toppled, spilling its porcelain occupants into cabinet, spilling its occupants into shattered. It strap snagged the edge of the cabinet and everything seemed to move in a slow motion as the cabinet teetered and toppled, spilling its porcelain occupants to the ground in shatters. Mr. Suspicion, Mr. Shifty, took the golden opportunity to make a run for it, but he didn't know who he was dealing with. With my heels clacking in protest, I dashed after him, shouting, You ain't going to get away easy, cowboy! That day, the citizens witnessed a fiery southern belle bent on justice, chasing down a man who picked the wrong woman to mess with. Chapter 2 I reckon I should explain how I got all tangled up with the man from the secondhand store. It all boiled down to my insatiable curiosity, which between me and you, I had a knack for landing me in questionable situations and on the wrong side of the law. But the Cheapside Diner was a perfect reflection of its name, Cheap. It served up greasy spoon classics that if you weren't careful, could lead you straight to an early grave heart attack on a plate style. Plus, they couldn't keep employees to save their lives. Just the sort of place I was hunting for my old Chevy truck rumbled into Slate's Creek Hollow, Kentucky, about a year back. Now, from the chit-chat I've overheard, flip-flopping between bar stools, wisdom, and gossip over grips, I'd gathered that Slate Creek Hollow was born out of the coal rush that swept through the Appalachia in the late 19th century. Researching wasn't really my style, and I preferred first-hand accounts from the locals, Piecing together their tales, I'd learned about the statue in the center of the town square depicting Jeremiah Pike, the pioneer who founded the town. In one hand, he clutched a chuck of coal, and in the other, he held a lantern. Once held a lantern. And once being the operative word. Because the lantern vanished ages ago, and townies blamed it on the youngins. Up to no good, but nobody knew for sure. And as for the town itself, it it wore its years like old weathered coats, surrounded by dense groves of pine and spruce and cut through by all the meandering State Creek Hollow. The place had seen better days, and the cobblestone of the town square was uneven and cracked, and the clock tower, gifted by the miners in the 1920s, had grown silent and no longer chiming in the hours. Time, it seemed, had taken a toll on Slate Creek Hollow, and the hollow bar was more than the rustic, but it was a certain charm with its bluegrass tunes and the apple pine moonshine, which between us, I was pretty sure wasn't exactly above board. But regardless, the Pike Memorial Library with its moss covered walls whispered of the town's glory days and, and perhaps of secrets that unearthed Granny Mabel's bakery, however, remained a beacon. Despite the town's hard times, Granny Mabel still spun tales of yesteryears and served the best cinnamon rolls this side of the Mississippi. And Lastly, there's the Slate Creek Inn, and the Flores Creek possibly complained about the decades they endured, and its windows offered views of the fog-kissed Appalachians. 
But for easy to think of Slate Creek Hollow as a setting for some feel-good Hallmark movie, but in reality, it bore the scars of a community grappling with hardship, holding on to memories of prosperity as long ago. And it wasn't far from idyllic, but it was real, and, and now it was home to me. Honestly, giving a town tour of Slate Creek Hollow was the furthest thing from my mind when I woke up this morning. And while slinging hash at the chief side for my morning shift, I caught snippets of conversation from regulars, mostly harmless gossip about who, whose hen stopped laying eggs or who'd won bingo last night or even who got picked up for selling the latest street drugs. But this morning, the chatter was different. There he was, sitting at the counter, looking all shifty. Now, I had my fair share of run-ins with questionable sides of humanity, so I can spot a fish out of water from a mile away. And while this fella practically floundering, he was trying hard to look nonchalant, nursing his coffee and glancing around like he was waiting for a sign. So there I was, refilling his mug, trying to catch the snippet of his hushed phone conversations and piecing together the puzzle. I mean, he could have just been another wayward traveler, but in Slate Creek Hollow, where every day feels like a rerun of the last, Mr. Shifty Eyes was shaping up to be the most exciting thing that happened here in a long time. And while I was refilling his mug, I caught the wind of something that froze me mid-pour. Two regulars were whispering about him, thinking I was out of earshot. Did you hear that? He's got that puppy ring going on, said one. His eyes darted over to the man. Out of that old rusty van of his, replied the other, disgust evident in her tone. Now, I'd been mixed up in some shady dealings in my day, but never, ever involving animals. And the very idea just twisted my insides. The man was trafficking puppies? I watched him, my mind race, every little thing he did from the way he nervously sipped his coffee to how he avoided direct eye contact now seemed a little sinister. When he tossed some cash on the counter and made his way out, I acted on impulse. Whipping my apron, I threw it to Arlene, one of the other waitresses. Cover me, will you? Get some personal business to attend to, I said, not waiting for a response. I darted out, praying that my hunch was wrong, but ready to confront whatever lay ahead. That rusty old van wasn't going to drive away without me knowing exactly what or who was inside it. And that's how I got to the secondhand store. Pulling up discreetly a few cars behind the rust bucket van, I reached over to the passenger seat, grabbing my pink rim sunglasses. They were flashy and a bit over the top, but they did the trick and shielded my identity, or at least that's what I had hoped. I slid them on, taking a moment to check my reflection in the rear view. He exited his van and entered the store, leaving me with the decision to make, to follow or not to follow. Taking a deep breath, I slipped out of my car, attempting the most nonchalant walk of my life. And before going in, I needed to see for myself, were there really puppies in the van? Slipping out of the car, I tiptoed out of the side of the van, at the side of his van, trying to silence the clatter of my heels against the pavement. Seriously, why had I worn heels today? Oh, right. Better tips and rent was coming up. I took a swift, careful peek through the tinted windows and no sign of any puppies. But what caught my attention were empty cages stacked up haphazardly in the back, enough to hold a small army of puppies. My gut churned. This was looking more and more like the whispers I'd heard. As I made my way to the entrance and pushed open the door to the store, the faint scent of mothballs and memories lingered. Old items with past unknown were displayed everywhere. I spotted him near the back. Our eyes met for just a split second, and an electrifying tension filled the room. And before I could move, he bolted, knocking a couple of trinkets off a shelf in his haste, heart-pounding adrenaline, cursing through my veins. I knew one thing was for certain. The chase was on. And just like that, in a sleepy town where the most action I got was the occasional bar fight at the hollow bar, I was sprinting after a potential puppy trafficker. The sounds of the clerk yelling for me to pay for all the broken, precious moments figurines reached my ears. Those aren't trinkets, Missy. Those are people's cherished memories, he hollered. But saving puppies were more pressing than porcelain. And as I rounded the corner, the sound of his footsteps echoing ahead, I couldn't help but think, Slate Creek Hollow just about got a whole lot interesting. And as I rounded the first corner, the sound of his steps echoing ahead, I couldn't help but think that Slate Creek Hollow was about to get a whole lot more interesting. Chapter 1 and 2 of Slight of Hand. <laughs> 